Face front non-believers, today is a little unique. Like most episodes I do, I am not an expert, I'm just a skeptic enthusiast. However, unlike most episodes, I happen to have some qualifications for today's topic. For those of you who don't know, Bill Nye has a web series over a big thing called Hashtag Tuesdays with Bill, where he answers student questions every Tuesday, I assume. A couple Tuesdays ago, he answered the question of a philosophy major. Hey Bill, Mike here. I'm a philosophy major in college right now, and I'm looking for your opinion on the subject. Some of the scientists like Stephen Hawking and Neil deGrasse Tyson have brushed it off as a meaningless topic. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on the subject. Now, at this point, I was fully expecting Bill Nye to defend philosophy. He's a bit more worldly than some of his PhD colleagues. He even had a career as a comedian, a profession that some people call the modern day philosopher. I was mistaken. The idea that reality is not real, or what you sense and feel is not authentic, is something I'm very skeptical of. Very mistaken. I think, therefore I am. Well, what if you don't think about it? Do you not exist anymore? What? What? If you drop a hammer on your foot, is it real or do you, or is it just your imagination? Ha! 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 Huh. Is reality not real? And we are all living on a ping pong ball that's part of a giant um, uh, interplanetary ping pong game that we cannot sense it. These are interesting questions. Let's continue this Chautauqua. I mean, what the fuck, Bill Nye? I don't even know where or how to begin. As I said, I may have qualifications, but I'm not an expert. So to help me, I brought in a couple hired guns. Today's episode has been co-written by Assistant Professor of Critical Thinking and First Year Studies at Stockton University, Robert Blaskwix. And PhD in philosophy, Dr. Dan Finke. I'll go into more depth about these awesome guys and this very unique writing process at the end. Well, let's start with something that a lot of people get wrong. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Mr. Nye seems to think this principle implies that thinking creates reality or existence. He's not alone. It's one of those classic misunderstandings that frustrate the philosophically literate. An analogy for you science literate folks would be when someone says that they believe in life after death because physics says you can't destroy energy and life is energy. Words are fun, aren't they? So imagine a philosopher dismissing all of science because the idea that there is life after death because energy never dies is something that I am very skeptical of. Cogito ergo sum is not saying or implying that things, even ourselves, exist because we are thinking them into existence or believing that they exist. And just to cover all our bases, I think therefore I am is also not saying anything akin to believe it, achieve it. When I was 11 years old, for example, I'm watching Star Trek The Next Generation with my dad and James Moriarty, the hologram, gains access to the physical enterprise, or so we think. Mind over matter. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. So, I think, therefore I am means that if you believe it, you can do it? No, he was conflating terms but still correctly pointing out that he is aware and therefore must exist. So he got onto the real ship because he knew in his heart he could. Uh, maybe according to the story, but that's not really what that means. Data to security. Sent two officers to holodeck so it was like a self-confidence Commercial's thing? over, shut the fuck up. Everything we know about holodeck physics. Then perhaps you don't know as much as you You're gonna be dead in four years. <laughs> So Descartes was not asking us to believe in ourselves, nor as Bill Nye thinks, was he implying that existence is dependent on us thinking about it. If a tree falls in the woods and no one thinks about it, 
Did I still shoot my wife? Maybe it's the shorthand translation that's fucking us up. I think therefore I am is a bit ambiguous. It's similar to you can't have your cake and eat it too. Most people are like, well, what's the point of having a cake if I can't eat it? Not realizing that the expression originated during a time when cake probably referred to a single pastry, so once you ate it, you no longer had it. A clearer way of expressing this might be you can't consume your cake and keep it at the same time. A clearer way of expressing cogito ergo sum would be the way that Descartes actually wrote out the principle. I am thinking, therefore I exist. Descartes was trying to answer the question, what can we know? This should actually be near and dear to every science enthusiast's heart. This is something that skeptics and scientists constantly keep at the forefront of their mind, that our senses can and do deceive us. This is how Bill, I call him Bill. Now Bill. And every other scientist construct their epistemological foundation. Every time Bill Nye himself has dismissed an anecdotal claim because that person can't know or prove what they experienced, this is the core philosophical principle that he was relying on. Well, I am thinking, so it's safe to assume that I exist. I may not have seen Bigfoot just now because I don't have any evidence outside of my own senses. I definitely exist. Think of it like setting up the parameters for a controlled thought experiment. Eliminating these variables in our experiment doesn't mean that they don't matter or aren't real. Eliminating your personal experience doesn't mean that what you're experiencing isn't real or even accurate, but it might not be. So let's put aside those questionable variables and focus in on what we can know, how we can know it, and how we can proceed to learn more. If Einstein, for example, asks you to imagine being in a stationary elevator on Earth versus one in deep space that is being accelerated at 9.81 meters per second squared, he's not trying to get you to doubt your location on Earth every time you can't see out of a fucking window any more than a philosophy professor teaching the discourse on method would expect you to test your reality by dropping a sledgehammer on your foot. A philosophy professor who presents you with cogito ergo sum isn't trying to get you to doubt your reality, man. We might just be brains in a matrix, yo. Any more than a scientist who teaches you double-blind procedure is trying to convince you that you probably have a neurological disorder. Major bummer, man. <laughs> Oh, by the way, Bill's sledgehammer test as an example of a philosophical test isn't just wrong, as Massimo points out, it's famously wrong. It has its own fallacy named after it. Look it up. It's so obviously bullshit, most textbooks about fallacious reasoning don't even include it. But you know who pointed out that such a philosophical test was bullshit? Philosophers. It reminds me of when anti-science people point out the mistakes of science, and scientists are like, yeah, we're the ones that figured that out. You're welcome. Or maybe they're more like, that was before you even met me. I told you that so you would understand me, not so you could try and keep the kids away. I kind of don't even want to touch Bill Nye's appeal to money because it turns my stomach. Both because I am a pretentious artsy guy who bought into the narrative of do what you love, and because of all the high-minded speeches I've seen Bill Nye deliver in person. But since, let's be real, career prospects matter, let me say us philosophy graduates are doing pretty damn good. In general, we have some of the highest GRE scores, so you can probably transition into a more lucrative graduate program. And if you stop at the BA, I certainly don't think you're in a worse position than anyone else who only has an undergrad. From my own anecdotal experience, I will say that my BA in philosophy opened a hell of a lot more office doors than my BA in theater arts. I know that isn't saying much, but even then, at the end of the day, most employers didn't see a guy who majored in philosophy and theater, which even I'll admit is ridiculous. They saw a guy who had two bachelor degrees on his resume. I used to make a lot of money in an office, believe it or not but I gave it all up for this. You're welcome. Also, I think it's only fair to mention that a lot of scientists in the world are out of science work, especially those who pursued fields so specialized that they don't even exist anymore. Hit up some School of Minds graduates sometime. 
Look, as far as I'm concerned, you go to a university to learn. And if you walk out with a degree, any degree, that's never a bad thing. If you're really that concerned with the bottom line, go to a fucking trade school. You'll be halfway done paying your mortgage by the time your old high school friends finish paying off their student loans. Scientists and skeptics who dismiss philosophy don't seem to realize that they're taking a philosophical stance that needs to be defended philosophically. Hell, I'll even go further than that. I'd say that every time a person rhetorically dismisses philosophy, they have engagingly validated that which they are trying to invalidate. It's like speaking out against the use of words. So am I saying that there's no such thing as a legitimate criticism of philosophy? Yeah. There is pretty much no such thing as a legitimate criticism of philosophy. In the same way that there is no such thing as a legitimate criticism of science. You can criticize certain methods, experiments, theories, analyses, but rejecting science as a whole is basically impossible. Even anti-science people are usually relying on a type of evidence to create a conclusion for their ideology. They're usually doing some crude form of science, and often what makes it so crude is bad philosophy. And this, this right here is what is so fucking painful about seeing Bill Nye dismiss his own ignorant version of philosophy. He's good at it. He defines his terms. He establishes what premises need to be satisfied to support certain conclusion. He places value on knowledge and even differentiates the importance of certain types of knowledge compared to others. In that very video, he even defends his empiricist philosophy, which, as Massimo points out, is in tension with advanced physics and even more with speculative scientific theorizing, such as the multiverse theory. Ironically, the majority of scientists who speak out against philosophy are good at philosophy. My concern there is that the philosopher believes they're actually asking deep questions about nature. If you are distracted by your questions so that you cannot move forward, you're not being a productive contributor to our understanding of the natural world. It devolves into a discussion of the definitions of words. Right. And I'd rather keep the conversation about ideas. Because you've already spent the last 40 years establishing and understanding the words you're using. Try having just a discussion about ideas with someone like Deepak Chopra, who did study a close approximation of what you guys call philosophy. Go ahead, try and have a conversation with him or Michael Behe without referencing epistemology or the philosophy of science. Would that not work out? Really? But they're doctors, and they use a lot of scientific words and ideas. They even come with their own compelling narratives. Maybe they never had an instinctual grasp of epistemology or an intuitive sense of the philosophy of science. Maybe they didn't have a mentor who would go on to write one of the definitive works of skeptical philosophy. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason that when we have a science conference, we don't invite Deepak Chopra. We invite Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson or Lawrence Krauss when we can't afford Tyson. No, he's actually a friend of mine. But, uh, um... In a way, I guess you can say that many skeptics and scientists who dismiss philosophy are victims of its success. It's like a group of really healthy people who dismiss the importance of medicine. Uh, vaccines are important for a while, but not so much anymore. Uh, philosophy is Im important for a while. Oh, sure, Bill. I mean, we only needed philosophers to invent maintain, improve, and even defend the scientific method up until 2005. But you guys got it from here, right? Don't you? I also think it's because evolutionary biologists haven't fought the fight. They sort of, they don't respect uh, the kinds of arguments that these people are making, and so they just ignore it and think that it's going to go away. And that's probably one of the problems, is they just haven't gone to task with these people in the way that they need to. Most self-respecting evolutionary biologists wouldn't give them the time of day. And I'd rather keep the conversation about ideas. Yeah. And when you do that, and you don't derail yourself on questions that you think are important, because philosophy class tells you this, right. but the scientist says, look, I got all this world of unknown out there, I'm moving on, I'm leaving you behind, and you can't even cross the street because you're distracted by what you are sure are deep questions you've asked of yourself. I, I don't have the time for that. Oh, fuck. I always thought I was just being an artsy idealist, but seriously, the world might actually need philosophers. Holy shit.
I think the biggest reason that scientists fail to acknowledge philosophy, even when they're blatantly using it, comes from our different disciplines' methodology. I think Robert Sokolowski captured it nicely when he was recalling a conversation he had had with a mathematics and philosophy professor Giancarlo Rota in An Introduction to Phenomenology. Rota had often drawn attention to a difference between mathematicians and philosophers. Mathematicians, he said, tend to absorb the writings of their predecessors directly into their own work. They do not comment on the writings of earlier mathematicians, even if they have been very much influenced by them. They simply make use of the material that they find in the authors they read. When advances are made in mathematics, later thinkers condense the findings and move on. Few mathematicians study works from past centuries. Compared with contemporary mathematics, such older writings seem to them almost like the work of children. In philosophy, by contrast, classical works often become enshrined as objects of exegesis rather than resources to be exploited. From what I know, this is very true. You could learn all about calculus without ever looking at a page of Newton's Principia Mathematica. But if you want to learn even a basic lesson on philosophy, you're going to have to read through some often archaic original sources. So the result of this is that in most cases when someone is referencing or utilizing a philosophical principle, you'll know it. Because it will be Latin and or esoteric, and it will often come with a citation of the original source. So what might be happening is that when you don't hear that kind of language or sources, you think, well, no, we're not doing philosophy, we're just being really good scientists. While not conducting any science experiments, we're promoting and defending science with really good science ideas, like falsifiability. Karl Popper? I barely know her! <laughs> this is basically the adult version of, I can't be doing philosophy, it's not boring. We can be pretty boring sometimes. Like science, we can be boring and pedantic, but we can be archaic. It doesn't help that a lot of philosophers and philosophy enthusiasts insist on using the Latin when referencing principles or pointing out fallacies. I guess personal attack doesn't sound as cool or official as argumentum ad hominem. And we often insist on citing or even quoting an original source as though the intrinsic value of a well-constructed argument needs a European designer before anyone will buy it. Which, sadly, is often the case. So I don't necessarily blame scientists for not knowing what philosophy is, even while they're using it. Even if we wanted to generously split hairs on Bill's behalf, and assume that he wasn't talking about the whole of philosophy, he was just talking about theoretical philosophy. Of course scientists love applied philosophy. This comes off as insightful and defensible as a first-year engineering student saying, well, applied physics is great, but what has theoretical physics done for me lately? As many of you savvy folks know, reality doesn't work that way. Deciding that we should only study things that will definitely be useful is like a gambler deciding she's only going to place bets that she'll definitely win. Also, the idea that knowledge is only worth pursuing in relation to its practical value is a disgusting level of anti-intellectualism and a shockingly trendy anti-intellectualism. Welcome to the cool table, Bill. At this point, some of you might be thinking, Whoa! Bill Nye's awesome! Don't trash the dude just because he didn't have poignant answers about things that aren't even his field. I mean, they interviewed him! He gave his best answer, he never claimed to be an expert on philosophy. Here's the deal with that. He is an extremely popular educator who spread misinformation, promoted anti-intellectualism, and denigrated academic fields that he knows nothing about. And most egregious of all, he wasn't even aware that he was unqualified to answer the question. I don't know if that's sad, scary, or hilarious. This is the same kind of proactive ignorance that you usually find in life coaches or naturopaths. I'm just telling people what to eat and how to live. If anything important comes up, I'll definitely recommend that they seek out a professional. So no, I don't feel like rolling over and shutting up. I don't feel like giving him a free pass, and ironically, a big part of that comes from the love I have for the man and his mission of science education. I expect more of him.
I expect more of a person as intelligent and noble as he is, and I don't use those terms lightly. Bill Nye has dedicated most of his life to educating the world, and he's done a hell of a job. And at the end of the day, I honestly don't think that one positively ignorant moment takes away from any of that. But let's not ignore it, even if he chooses to. Because correcting someone's mistake or debunking a false claim isn't always about changing the mind of the person who made the mistake or perpetuated the false claim. It's about getting the right information out there for everyone else. So here's hoping I came close. Thanks for watching. And so you have to, everybody, we have to be patient. Or we have to keep the message going in a positive way. And it's really easy to sink in that, into that you're an idiot, you suck point of view. Well, I hope you enjoyed this extremely long video. I especially hope that Dan Fink and Robert Blaskowitz enjoyed it. This was an interesting piece, and I took an approach with it that I've never taken before. I've collaborated with other writers in the past, but it's usually been me rewriting something that they had written or vice versa or one of us writing something based on the other's idea. This was more like an amalgamation. I approached Robert and Dan. I told them my objectives and asked for their thoughts with the idea that I would be quoting them throughout this video. After reading Robert's analytical breakdown and several of Dan's blog posts, as well as his Facebook thread on the subject that he allowed me to pull from, I began to realize, number one, we all had fairly similar thoughts on the matter, and I didn't want to have to pick between who to quote or redundantly express everyone's opinions. And number two, sometimes Dan and Robert's words would inspire me to rephrase an idea or give me a new idea altogether, and I didn't want to not give credit where credit was due. So I decided to take all of our words, grind them up, and stuff them into a skeptically pwned sausage with a three-way credit split. Think of me like a lead author who didn't wait for his colleague's approval. Here are some of the places you can find Dan. And here are some of the places you can find Robert. Everything linked below. They're awesome guys. Check them out. I also hope it's kind of a head trip for Robert and Dan to hear their ideas and words coming out of my mouth. In the way that ideas and words come out of my mouth.